Hi folks, so we're going to talk about a, a variant on the Krebs cycle called the glyoxylate cycle. Uh, and this is a version of the Krebs cycle that is used in areas where carbon is kind of rare. I suppose if you don't have something like glucose that has six carbons at a time, um, or if you're you know living in a poor carbon environment like the ocean, um, you may want to have a version that's really conservative of carbons instead of spending them out um, as CO2s. So we don't want to lose those CO2s. We'd rather use those CO2s and fix them. Um, and so this is a very common cycle in plants and in fungi and bacteria. Um, and it's actually found in, uh, in many mammals and uh, in nematode animals as well, but it doesn't have the same function, right? So um, the key thing about this is it allows net synthesis of uh, sugar from fats. Okay. So acetyl-CoA, if you recall, I've mentioned this before, um, is the main breakdown um, of fats. And we can't use our fat to make sugar, our blood sugar, right? The fats that we burn in our body are used as fuel by the cells. They're not used to make new glucose. That's what uh, like your amino acids are used for. So if you're starving to death, you're using fats as fuel, but you're also burning your proteins out of your body to keep your blood sugar up, right? So you're using kind of two different fuel sources, fat and sugar. Um, that's coming from amino acids in your own muscles. So you waste away from your muscles as well as your fat, right? And so... Um, we don't have this cycle because every time we would take an acetyl-CoA in, we're going to lose it within, you know, just a few steps here. The two carbons we put in are going to come out. And so we can't, for example, do PEP-CK to make uh, PEP, right? We're never going to be able to take off OAA and net synthesize sugars because every time we go through this, uh, we won't be able to continue the cycle, um, and it, we might as well just have undone pyruvate to do that, right? We can do gluconeogenesis, but we can't use acetyl-CoA as a main source because we're losing the carbons that we need, okay? So in order to undo this, we need to skip these two steps, right? So we're going to say not isocitrate dehydrogenase, not alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. So we're going to be starting with isocitrate, and remember that these two carbons are the ones from uh, acetyl-CoA, and we're gonna do something called isocitrate lyase. Isocitrate lyase is a important um, enzyme. I remember a lyase is something that breaks a molecule down without using a water. It's the opposite of a hydrolase in that way. The hydrolase uses water, a lyase doesn't use water. Isocitrate lyase is going to do, um, essentially pull off this hydrogen to make a double bond and then kick off a succinate, right? So maybe I should show it like this. Um, but it also is gonna break off this bottom two carbons as a molecule called glyoxylate. Um, and the reason that this allows for net synthesis is that we're going to make malate out of this, which is going to allow us to get OAA, um, if we add a second acetyl-CoA. So this is what's called malate synthase. Um, and so we're going to attach this in the same way as what we did uh, when we were doing citrate synthase. But now we're going to be making malate from a second acetyl-CoA, which means that we can still get our electron transport done. We're skipping out on most of the, of the full yield here. We're going to still get an NADH. We're still going to get one QH2. But now with using glyoxylate, we're only getting 5 ATP per uh, acetyl-CoA instead of 12. And that's 10 ATP per glucose instead of 24. And so under this circumstances, we're, we're sacrificing yield to maintain carbons. And if you ever think about like a sunflower seed, sunflower seeds are just full of oil or coconuts, right? Coconuts are full of oil. Oil is a really, or fats and oils are really strong and dense sources of energy. Um, and that's the way we would like to, 
to you know store our energy if possible we do it for ourselves too but you know a tree like a coconut from that seed needs to be able to make all the wood products all the cellulose all the stuff that a tree needs to grow from um, and so it needs this kind of a, a, a pathway to be able to synthesize carbohydrates and so since we can make every time we run this we're going to end up with extra two carbons coming in and we're not wasting two carbons we can net synthesize oxaloacetate every time we do this really easily right and we'll still be able to do this so we're going to end up with double quantities of this every single time which means that one of these can go back and do gluconeogenesis right which is nice so we still get some decent amount of energy we also end up net synthesizing oaa which can be made into pep and then go back up gluconeogenesis to make um, cellulose right or whatever other sugars we need to make but we sacrifice quite a lot of yield we go from uh, our 24 ATP per glucose by Krebs down to 10 ATP per glucose by glyoxylate okay so we skip these two irreversible steps here we also skip over the substrate level phosphorylation we skip straight on to succinate and we make a malate and both of those guys will converge to make double oaas right so this is kind of a, a clever way of being able to synthesize uh sugars from fats now we can't do that uh, we have to burn our fats as fuel we have no other choice but if we had the glyoxylate cycle we could net make carbohydrates and make blood sugar from from fats and then we just we're just unable to do that because these enzymes don't work in the same way in our bodies okay so I'm going to kind of back up here and talk about control of the pathway, uh, and then we will finish. All right. So looking back at the regular Krebs cycle, uh, let's talk a little bit about regulation. Uh, the key idea here is we have acceptor control, which means if we have lots of NAD, favors the cycle and if we have lots of NADH we repress the cycle right because I mean we have three steps that make NADH here we have the uh, malate dehydrogenase we have the isocitrate dehydrogenase step and we have the alkaketoglutarate dehydrogenase step so all three of those are going to be making NADHs if you have a lot of NADHs you end up with a repression um, and so the way that works is lots of NADHs are going to work on the rate determining step okay now we have three steps that are irreversible here the citrate synthase step the isocitrate dehydrogenase step and ketoglutarate dehydrogenase step all three of those are not considered to be reversible because number one we talked about how co2 can't be put back in the bottle we can't we need to have special enzyme cofactors to put co2 back onto the molecule um, and so without being able to do that those are irreversible steps and so those are flux control points and then citrate synthase is also a flux control point um, because it's the first one, the entry control, right? It's That's where acetyl-CoA is coming in. Now, we've also already talked about control of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Um, we've talked about ATP and acetyl-CoA, ATP, uh, acetyl-CoA, NADH, fatty acids. Those all repress the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, whereas uh, AMP, low energy, of course, uh, free CoA, NAD, and insulin help to favor the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And so that's going to limit how much of the acetyl CoA is going to be able to enter the cycle. But we also consider um, NADH being a repressor of citrate synthase. Also, succinyl CoA, if we start to build up succinyl CoA, because CoA is a lot like acetyl CoA in fact the only thing that's different is it has two extra carbons on it um, it's going to act as a competitive inhibitor here it's going to come back and shut things down also if you have a lot of substrates or it's a lot of products here you can come back and repress right if we have too much citrate building up remember that this can be brought out into the cytoplasm for fatty acid synthesis for example uh, if we start to build up we'd rather shuttle that out to do uh, fat storage instead of keeping it for burning in the mitochondrion um, and then, of course, um, the basic cell autonomous control uh, is to have AMP, ADP come and turn this guy on, right? Lots of ways to shut it down. 
really the only thing that's going to turn it on is having low energy, right? Because that's the whole purpose of this pathway is to generate energy. Um, we also would consider the same thing happening at the other two flux control points, right? We would consider AMP to be activating at both of these ones. And we would also consider ATP to be repressive of those two flux control points. Um, so that's relatively uh, simple, but um, the ATP really only works at this first one, interestingly enough, right? Uh, mostly because they're linked and ATP doesn't need to regulate two different steps if one of them is controlling the other. The other guy um, is gonna be feedback inhibited by succinyl-CoA, okay? Um, in the same way, remember that ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is similar to pyruvate dehydrogenase. It's going to repress both of the cousin um, enzymes, right? So CoA, anything using CoA is going to be repressed. Uh, and NADH also will work as a repressor here. Uh, insulin, insulin is going to activate both of them. Insulin is going to activate both of these to make them go faster. And this is through, we've talked about uh, how calcium works here. When insulin comes in, uh, calcium is, is brought into the cell. And so both the, the increase of calcium helps modulate these activities through, through a variety of means. But that's kind of the basic control of the Krebs cycle. Um, it's largely controlled through NAD and NADH, also through ATP. So we have a high AMP would be favorable. Having high ATP would be disfavorable. All right. And then there's some basic long level feedback inhibition and close range feedback inhibition uh, by products at these flux control points. All right. So understand how this, this kind of acceptor control works, also how some of the feedback control works, uh, and you should have a pretty good grasp of this concept.